let's get in the word today. Excited to preach God's word. Going to make this baptism message applicable for your life everywhere, uh, for all stages of the faith. All right. So, uh, I don't know if you uh, like to gamble. Uh, anybody like to gamble? Uh, good. You can't say that in church, right? <laughs> My hand's not up because I like to gamble. I'm just using it as an illustration. I just think it's Super Bowl today. Anybody making any bets on the Super Bowl? Would you? Okay, that's good. Uh, you know, I don't like to gamble because I hate to lose money. I hate to lose money. I hate to spend money. Heck, all the married men said yes and amen. I'm like, why do we have to have soap all the time? You know, it's like, it's like well, we got to buy toilet paper. Just go get a leaf or something. You know, like, I'm just saying, I don't like to spend. I don't like to lose money. That's really what I like to and, uh, and gambling, though, has its benefits, obviously, if you win, all right? Not telling you to gamble. If you have a gambling problem, 188, you know, whatever. <laughs> but uh, there's a story. This cracked me. It doesn't, it actually is very sad. But a woman, she was at a casino in, uh, in Queens, New York City, and uh, she was doing a slot machine, and it showed that she won $42 million. 949,672 dollars. Wow. Um, and so I don't know about you, but that day I would have gone home. I would not have driven myself home. I would have called uh, Uber Extra or whatever it is, right? <laughs> I might've had a helicopter come pick me up if I would've won, whatever. And so she wins, right? And so she goes home. The next day she comes back to collect and they tell her she actually only won $2.25. Uh, the, the, the machine malfunctioned. And, and when it malfunctions, it voids all pays and all plays. Can you imagine? What would you have done if you were at the casino that day? I know I'm saved, kinda, but like, wow, I might not have been at that moment. <laughs> I'd have been like the saved from Philly kind of saved. <laughs> well, Bible in one hand, a fist in the other. You know what I'm saying? Like, what? Like, because you know she ordered something good that night. And it's like, who's paying for that now? 225 is not going to get it done. And uh, so gambling, while it might have some benefits, also might have some, some problems right? Uh, that said, I, I do think, however, uh, this is kind of the strategy and the play of the enemy. Uh, the enemy will show us something, but we'll experience something completely different. It's deception. Uh, the, the way that we experience sin sometimes is for a moment, there is a thrill. For a moment, there is an excitement. But then when that moment passes, we find ourselves in a deeper pit and in a deeper hole. We, we haven't actually won, we've lost. We've set ourselves up for more trouble and more problems. The enemy is a liar and a deceiver and he will make you think something or see something that isn't really what it is. The way that the enemy deceives us is he thinks we've won, but it's a cheap payout. You think you're winning, but in the last moment, you realize it was a hoax, a scheme, a lie to create a false sense of security. I mean, I mean, think of Jesus standing, right? And, and Satan comes to him and he's in the wilderness and he's standing there and Satan's like, hey, if you just bow to me, then I'll give you the kingdoms of the world. It's a facade. It's a false sense of security. Did Jesus come for a kingdom? Yes. But not one that could be built or given by man, one that can only be lived from the inside out. And so what we do is we often trade what God's meant for us for what we feel and want right now because we're being deceived. And it matters where you wager. It matters where you bet. And some of us, we for a long time have bet on the wrong things. For some of us, our lives, we have chased and sought the thrill. We've chased and thought of trying to fill ourselves and give ourselves satisfaction and security, but it slips out from under us. And so it leaves us in a darker pit, a broken place. It leaves us to losses and disappointments. But can I tell you today, there is a source uh, there is an answer to every pain, every disappointment, every trial and trouble. It doesn't ma mean all things get perfect right away, but there is a source for healing from bondage and from slavery. 
his name is Jesus. And when we bet on Jesus, it turns out the way it's supposed to. Maybe not the easiest, maybe not uh, the most magical, magical quick fix, but when we bet on Christ, wow, does it work to our favor. And today, I wanna teach you how to wager the right way. I wanna teach you a wilderness wager. That's the title of my message today, a wilderness wager. And uh, as, we, um, as we discuss what baptism is, my hope is that you would gain a great hunger and desire to walk in the will of God. Uh, not just to do some act, but to really experience the fullness and the abundance of what God's promised you. And I want to give you a scripture about baptism before I read through Exodus. And Paul writes, he says in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 2, for I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. He's talking about Moses, the people of Israel. And we're all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So Paul's writing, giving this illustration that our forefathers, the Israelites, Moses, they passed, they had a cloud by day and they passed through the sea, which represented baptism. Now, N.T. Wright, who is a great theologian, he writes and explains this. And I want you to see this and, and, and hear this with me. He says, baptism then becomes the exodus moment, the equivalent of the Red Sea for the renewed people of God. Just as Paul speaks of the Israelites being baptized into Moses when crossing the Red Sea, I just read it, so here the whole renewed people is baptized into the Messiah. So similarly, when you go into a tank, when the water is poured over you, you're baptized into Christ. Baptism corresponds to the Red Sea, the spirit of the Torah, the Old Testament where we find the story in Exodus. And Abraham's family, we are the descendants of Abraham, now defined in terms of Jesus' messianic death and resurrection, are therefore on their way to inheriting the promise and must not think of going back to Egypt, so to speak. Now, you see the reference to Romans 8 there. What is happening in Romans 8? It is that you and I are sons and daughters. We are heirs to the throne. We are in relation with the Father, meaning we don't have to bet and gamble to try to win something. We've already won. Yeah. And so this is the promise that we have, that we are victors, that we fight from victory, not for victory, that in the end, when all the nonsense of life ends, we stand and sit and worship Jesus together. That's good news. And baptism illustrates this journey of faith. And I want to read a, the story of the people of Israel today, but I got to give you a little bit of context before we read, because the first 13 chapters of Exodus really tells the story of the Israel nation, which has become enslaved by the Egyptian people. This is 400 years after Joseph was second in command in Egypt. And what's happened to the Israel, the Israelites, God's people, is they have stayed in slavery and have gotten comfortable with being enslaved. And for many of us, the longer that we stay in our sin, our habitual sin, our, our, the longer we stay in the comfort of where we are instead of going where we're supposed to be, the, the easier it is to stay, the harder it is to go. Even though we're slaves and even though we go back and we eat our vomit, so to speak, like dogs, even though we do this, right? It's more, com we're, more we're familiar with the spirit of slavery rather than the spirit of freedom that's promised. And so the people of God have been here for years and they've just grown comfortable with this place. But Moses, who was born, he was no ordinary child. There's a miraculous story to his life, ends up in the care of the Egyptians and he's got an identity crisis. And at some point he sees that his people are being enslaved and beaten and he can't take it anymore. And then Moses, he kills an Egyptian and then he flees, but God meets him in the desert. It's important for you to understand that sometimes what you thought was tragic and what you thought you lost was actually a gain. That Moses lost royalty, but he gained God. He gained an identity and a potential and a future. And God meets him at this burning bush and he says, listen, Moses, I've got greater plans for you than wasting away in a kingdom eating cheese. I want to give you something greater. So pick up the staff and there's a whole story with it. You got to read it. But ultimately, Moses becomes then the shepherd of God's people. Exodus 4.20, it's really remarkable. And he goes and he has a speech impediment and he's freaking out, but God uses him anyway. 
by the way, a murderer with a speech impediment, God chooses to use him to deliver the people. And when Pharaoh does not want to let the people go, when he does not want to let the people go, God sends 10 plagues. And finally, after the firstborn of all of the Egyptian people die, Pharaoh finally lets the people go and Moses takes them. And they're going, but then Pharaoh backs out on this promise. And that's where we pick up in Exodus chapter 14, because Moses stands at the precipice of the Red Sea with a nation of people behind him, with a complaining nation who says, we kind of wish we stayed in slavery. And he stands there and I've never used the word precipice right. And I've said it a million times, but what it means is you're standing at the water's edge of a cliff about to go. It's the edge of it all. He's standing there with a nation behind him, knowing another nation's coming to kill his nation. God, why did you do this? Have you ever asked that before? I know I'm narrating a little bit, but like, God, why, why did you do this? You, you did all this drama, all this stuff. You got me to this point so that we're going to die. And Exodus 14.10 says that when Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them and they feared greatly. I mean, sure, God did 10 miraculous plagues and got them out of there, but they still feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Some of you do that to your leaders, by the way. They're trying to bring you into God's best and you're complaining to them because God's best isn't always cakewalk. It's hard work. Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. See, they're standing at the edge of the water and what's about to happen is they're going to be baptized. This is the symbolism. And what water baptism reminds us of is who we were. It reminds us of who we used to be because the Israelites are going, we were in Egypt. We were slaves for 400 years. This was our identity. And sometimes we get to the water's edge. We come to church. We stay around the things of God. Sometimes we even go to groups and we even watch other preachers and we have a familiarity with the things of God, but there's still a whole lot of Egypt in us. And when we go into the tank, when we get baptized, when we accept our redeemer who is Christ and then get baptized, What it's doing is as we sit there before the water flows, it reminds us of who we were. And it's good to be reminded of who we were because who we were apart from Christ is no one at all. But by grace alone, who am I? I I am no one except because God saved me. Essentially what the Israelites though were saying was, is God leave me alone in Egypt. It's better to be a slave of my enemy than have my freedom for eternity. Some of us are willing to literally trade our freedom for this life and eternity because we're comfortable with slavery in our present. And this is why following Jesus and specifically water baptism is so, baptism is so powerful because it's you and I standing at the water's edge deciding that slavery is more fulfilling than surrender. All who have been baptized previously have stood at this edge and determined that it was worth dying on their own terms. What do I mean by that? Well, if we go to Romans chapter six, verse one, Paul writes again, we were buried therefore with him by, excuse me, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Uh, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ, Jesus were baptized into his death? Can't separate those. We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like this, we certainly will be united with him in a resurrection like this. So so what, what is Paul saying? Paul is essentially saying you can't separate the death and the life. One has to happen for the other to happen. 
So when I say, are you going to choose death on your own terms? Really, it means, are you going to go back to Egypt and die? Or are you going to walk into Christ and die? See, you're going to die either way. You're going to stay in Egypt and die or be crucified with Christ and die. One death has the consequence of death. The other death has the benefit of life. So in order to move past Egypt, you have to be willing to die in the process. But the beautiful thing is this is what God does. He lets you choose. How do you want to die? Do you want to die and go back to who you were? And as you sit at the edge of the water, as you sit in that seat or move from the seat to the tank, do you want to go, am I going to skip this moment? Am I going to say no to God again? Or am I going to get in and just die and surrender and let him transform and be raised to life with him? See, the first part of baptism is getting in the water, moving from your seat to the sea. This is the death that Paul describes being crucified with Christ. Baptism really does help us remember and put to death who we were. It's stepping on the neck of slavery to sin and shame. The devil came to still steal, kill, and destroy, but God came to give life and life abundantly, an adventure, a thrill, a thrill that cannot be taken or shaken. See, baptism helps us remember who we were. And in verse 13, Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to earn it. He's going to do it. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. How many of you would love it if you never saw the enemy lying to you in your face about the same stuff over and over again? The Lord's going to fight for you and you have only to be silent. See, water baptism, it doesn't just remind us who we were. It also reminds us of who he is. Who he is. See, the word fight used in Exodus 14 means to devour or to feed on. When the scriptures say God will fight for you, it it literally means God's not only going to push back your enemies, he's going to devour the sin. When you choose to leave Egypt and step towards the water's edge, God is devouring your mistakes. You become new. The scriptures say that the old you is gone, the new you has come. When the water comes over you, when you come up out of the water, essentially You are a new creation. When you receive and accept Christ, that symbolism, you coming up, you're new. And some of us, we hold on to the guilt of what was Egypt, what was our past. We hold on to the divorce and the shame and all the guilt and all the sin and all the stuff. And when you're at the water's edge, you're reminded of who God is and that he's greater for all those things. I wonder, I wonder if as Moses stood on the precipice of the ocean. And as he looked back and he's sitting here going, okay, I've got a whole nation of people and I've got an an enemy behind me. And like, we can't go around the ocean. The, The only way to get away from the enemy is to go through the ocean, but this is impossible. Like, God, this is impossible. What, what do we do? And as Moses looks over, I just imagine him seeing his reflection in the water. I imagine him seeing the, the rushing sea and, and going, God, I'm about to bet on you. I've trusted you up to this point and it's, it's been challenging. I'm about to make a bet on you. Please don't let me down. And I just, I just believe this internal struggle going on with Moses as he looks in and what does Moses see in the water? See, similarly to baptism, as you're in there, what do you see in the water? If baptism reminds us of who God is, I believe Moses is looking and he's not seeing the murderer. He's not seeing the stutterer. He's not seeing the identity crisis. He's not seeing any of those things. He's seeing who God made him to be. He can see the reflection of the staff. He can see the reflection of the people. God made him to be a shepherd. And in that moment, it was clear. And what I'm telling you is baptism is so symbolic because what it is, it's not who you used to be. It's not the identity that you've hung your life onto. You're looking over and you're seeing all that God has called you and made you to be. Stop living in the guilt of Egypt. Stop living in the identity, the political identity, the sexual identity, the business and money identity, all that nonsense. Let it go. 
And as you stand at the edge of the water, make the bet on God. Let him show you who he is, that he is all powerful. He is mighty. He is a deliverer. He is a redeemer. He will change your life if you let him. See, when we come to the edge of the baptism waters, we no longer see ourselves, but rather the person of Jesus Christ. And we say farewell to the former things and hello to the greater things. And Moses speaks for God. He says, fear not, God's got this. And that's scary for a leader to say. I mean, I make these proclamations every week and I'm like, okay, God's got your back, you know, let's go. But it's kind of like, I'm kind of betting on God. He's gonna come through for you like he's come through for me. But man, he never let us down. And see, you have to understand something. Moses really... He's a type and shadow for Christ in this story. Moses is the redeemer of God's people and Jesus is the redeemer of us. And as Moses says, fear not, he's speaking for God. And today I stand before you, hopefully prophetically speaking God's unctions to you, but saying what Jesus has been and would be saying over you, fear not and trust me. Jesus would say oh, over you today, lean not on your own understanding. I do miracles. I am still the miracle worker, miracle maker, way maker. That's what Jesus would say. He'll say, I'll carry your burdens. Come to me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Plant the seed and I'll make it grow. No better. Be the seed and I'll make you grow. Have faith. Have faith in me. You can see the impossible. I'll go before you. I'll fight for you. In fact, I already did. I hung on a cross. I was raised to life. I took the beating so you wouldn't have to be still and know that I'm God. See, baptism is this clear acknowledgement that we need a redeemer. And it's the public proclamation that we trust him as such. And as the people of God, as they followed Moses into the parting waters, they trusted him in that moment as redeemer. And when you say yes to God, and when you get into a baptism tank, what you're saying is, God, I trust you as redeemer. I can't do it on my own anymore. I've tried it on my own. And Egypt has, Egypt, Egypt has this pool on me, but I'm done living that way. See, once we get in that water, it means we're all in. Now, it's important for you to understand something that first comes the declaration and the belief. It comes the surrender to the Redeemer, then comes the baptism. There's a process. There's a process of saying, okay, I need you, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. I, I know that you are something that I'm not, and I need that. You confess him, and you believe him, and then you walk but it can happen momentaneously. Jesus, I need you, then I'm in the water. Because think about this. See, a lot of people think that the baptism stuff needs to be more formal. And that's why many of us got baptized as a baby because our parents wanted us to be baptized as a kid, hoping that we would follow Jesus. And so we were sprinkled and I'm not denying any of that. They had hopes. They had hopes that you would follow God, but that's, that's not really how it works because think about the people of Israel. They're in Egypt one moment, they're complaining to their leader the next moment, but then they're trusting him in the next moment. And then they're being baptized into his work the next. And so you cannot be baptized until you trust the redeemer first, and then you walk. So if you were baptized as a baby, as a child, we praise God that you were dedicated and that when you do say, I need the redeemer and then actually be baptized as an adult or as a teenager or in a way that you understand who the Redeemer is, then you've actually begun to walk through the water. Do you understand? All right, I, I wanna finish. There's a, lot, there's a lot here, but ultimately there's a scripture that I love that just means a lot to me. And it says that the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. Also, and we don't have to read it, but James reminds me that when I resist the enemy, he'll flee from me. And it's, that's what the people of God are doing. They're resisting their pride. They're resisting their shame, their guilt, their old identity. And they're saying, okay, I trust the redeemer. We're moving and we're drawing near to God. 
And then in verse 15, as I close, the Lord says to Moses, dude, why are you crying to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forth. It's just this one last moment of like, okay, okay, faith without works is dead. Like, okay, like, okay, we, we've gotten this far. We've, you've seen some, you know, some plagues. You, you, I had somebody speak for you. You did some crazy stuff, but like, guess what? I keep on getting better. Guess what? You haven't seen anything yet. That's the beauty of this journey with God. You think you've seen a lot? You think you've seen the goodness of God? I believe we haven't seen anything yet. I believe our best days are ahead. I believe that revival is on the way. I believe that the Spirit of God is about to pour out on our nation like never before. I believe we haven't seen anything yet. And the people haven't. See, they made the decision. See, faith, right? It has its rewards. It's the bet. It's the gamble, okay? I'm going to trust you. I'm going to take some steps. But you understand that the waters aren't just... They're walking into the water. Like, I believe it went like this. Okay, now, I wasn't there. And I'm getting old and I'm getting bald and stuff. But, like, I wasn't there. But, listen... You understand that's like, okay, they start walking and I guarantee you, because this is how God does us. Their feet are getting wet. And like, God, I wore Nikes today. Like, yo, you were supposed to park this John like earlier. And God's like, no, no, you, right? Faith without works is dead. And like, you got to keep trusting me. And so they do like, this is why we haven't seen anything yet because we got to keep moving forward up and out. It's like, okay, we're going and like, it's wet. And like, God, are you going to show up? Like, hello, they're about to kill me. And all of a sudden, little by little, little by little, little by little, it's just, it's moving. And like, God doesn't show you the whole thing. He can't because you'd throw it away. He's too good. He's too smart for that. Where's the faith in that? You got to bet on God. See, the Hebrew word for forward means up and out. And as they, as they went through the water, see, there's a process. Okay, that's not who I am anymore. I accept that. Now I'm going to receive the Redeemer. I'm going to accept Moses, right? Moses is a type and shadow for Christ. I'm going to accept Christ. And then I'm going to walk. I'm getting out of the seat to the seat. And then I'm going to move forward. That's the process. And it represents you going under and then coming up a new creation. Now, the Israelites walk through the sea and then they wander for 40 years. That kind of took a bad turn. We were like, oh, we got victory. <laughs> you know? The problem is, is it's easy to wander. And there's some people watching right now that you have been baptized. You, you've gone through the sea, but you've been wandering. You, you've been, you've been, and like God's promised you a promised land, but somewhere along the way, you got caught up in the remnants of Egypt and you got to rid yourself of that. Because you can leave Egypt and Egypt not leave you. And so wherever you are, all we got to do is come back to center, come back to true north and just say, Jesus, redeem, make me right. Colossians 2.12 says, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith and the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. I believe, I believe that when you come up and out, you're going to move forward, but we got to do it together. And as I close this time, understand something that this glorious baptism, this visual, this, this illustration of salvation and baptism, guess what? Nobody walked through those waters by themselves. They did it together. And while you might be in a tank technically on your own, or when you stand before God and when you raise your hand, you're, you're, you're technically on your own, you're really not. We're together. That's the, pur that's the purpose of this is the people of God. This is the image of the church. It's like, no, we're all going together. We're all moving for up and out. No man left behind in the ethos of our nation, of our military. When someone is captured behind enemy lines, what do we do? We go rescue them. 
And that's exactly what we're doing today. We are plunging the depths of hell and Egypt and we are going to rescue and move you forward together. We're together, we're known, let's go, let's move. And today, some of you right now, you need to sign up to be baptized next week. You're not doing it alone. Or even today, you might be in the studio audience and you came and you're like, why did I come? Somebody duped me into coming here today. But like, you need to just, you just need to go in the tank today. And like, this wasn't an accident. The weather was crazy just for you. Together we go under, and then we go up and we go out. You see, friends, baptism reminds us of where we are headed. It reminds us of who he is, who we were who he is and where we are headed. We are headed to a promised land and we're not gonna get distracted. Today starts the rest of your life. Today starts the rest of your life, come on. Make no excuses. So wherever you are, if you're here, I want you to stand. If you're at home or watching, just pay attention to this last moment because some of us are far from God. We've either wandered or we're still in Egypt. And if you're still in Egypt or if you've wandered and you're far from God, today's the day to get right. Let's tear down those idols. Let's tear down those sacred things and let's surrender all again. Let's remember the power of the tank, of the baptism, what God called us to. If you are far from God today, maybe you've never accepted or invited him or you've wandered. If that's you, would you wave your hand at me right now in the chats? Would you wave at me? Would you let us know you want to get right with God today? If you're here, if you're in the chats, please, 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 we, I see you. Let's get right with God today. We're gonna say this prayer out loud for those stuck in Egypt and for those who've wandered. We're coming home today. We're walking through the water. Come on, let's pray out loud. Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. I need you and I trust you as redeemer. Be my Lord, be my leader of all my days. In Jesus' name, amen.